One of the largest flaws that I noticed when making this though is you lose the choice of your Pokemon. That means you're just stuck with the same, in my case, three attacks. You don't get to change your type. You're always just normal and essentially you're either just strong enough to win the fight or you aren't. You're not picking what is best for a fight. So it gets rid of that whole aspect and I have a bunch of ideas for fixes and we'll mention that a little bit later. So when I first started I was trying to mimic the style exactly and this quickly became a chore. I worked like this for about two weeks straight and seriously thought about just giving up on this project altogether just because it was so mind numbing. I don't know, it didn't seem interesting until I started adding my own touches. So the first thing I did was create different zones. So there's essentially three levels of grass you walk through to get through the first route. Each one I set up with a difficulty zone and when you bump into it the enemies get stronger and there's also a small chance to find a rarer Pokemon in there. And then I added a Pokedex to track the rare Pokemon. So if you're in a zone where the Pokemon are, it will let you know that there's still a Pokemon you haven't found there. And once you found all of them, it will tell you there's nothing new to find. And once you find and defeat them in battle, you will get bonuses and the Pokedex will also show you your bonuses. Alright, enough with the gameplay. How does this all work? Well, we started off trying to make that clunky movement that Pokemon has where essentially if you tap over or hold over you're gonna move at the same speed and you're gonna go the same distance which is gonna be one square over and this is done using tile movement just match that behaviors grid width with the size of your pixels which I use 16 by 16s but then since you want your character to be able to overlap items like the size of buildings or if you're in front of a tree we had to make our character taller than 16 pixels and this caused our first problem where he would bump into solid objects. So the common workaround for this problem is creating the tile movement on a 16 by 16 square and we just set that to invisible and then we create our taller than 16 pixel character and we don't have the solid behavior affect this character. We instead just set this character to that square we created and then the square will do all of the collision for us and then we continually just replace our character on top of that square. So now if our tile is in front of a tree, our character will be overlapping that tree. So essentially you ignore collisions with your character and then keep track of where his feet are with the square. So after solving the tile movement, I moved on to pixel art and spent pretty much my first full weekend, about 12 hours. Uh, just creating different sprites. We got the four directions for Deadpool, both walking and standing. And most of the tile maps, which are the trees and fences and ground. And then I went to work laying the pieces to make it look pretty similar to what Pokemon actually looks like. And then once I had the grounding laid out, I decided to build in the direction the game actually runs. So the first thing I programmed were the signs, which I gave all pop-up windows. And for these, I just had a sprite for the background of the text and a text box that are pinned together. And whenever I need the sign's text to come up, I just move those on top of the screen. And then when I press space, it'll finish the typewriter. And when I press space again, it'll push those sprites back off the screen. And then I can use them again for another time. So this gave us our bug of being able to walk while reading the sign. So I went in and created a boolean, which I called chat pause and anytime I'm talking to a sign I set it to true and then I just disable it when I move the sprites for the sign away and while chat pause is true I stop the tile movement. The next bit of code going up was the trigger for stepping into the grass for the first time which activates this little story mode in the beginning. In order to trigger this only one time I set up another boolean on this object and I called this activated. I set this to false originally and then when I'm checking to see if I'm triggering this event, I make sure that the activate trigger is on false. And once I trigger it, I set it to true. And this is just going to force it so it can only happen one time. So I force it to true and then I run the scene. And at this point I just use another boolean to lock the character like I did for the signs. And then I just have a sequence of events trigger one after the other. This didn't cause any minor bugs. 
So I was able to get through this pretty quick. And my next project was the fights. So once I put down the grass, I added a bouillon on my player for is hunting. And anytime I was in the grass, I would set that to true. Out of the grass, set it back to false. So now if is hunting is true as well as I am currently moving, it will start tracking two different numbers. So the first number is going to be a growing number and it will continue to grow while is hunting is true and I'm moving until I go into combat. And the other one is just rolling a random number that is quite large. And if that first value that constantly goes up is higher than my random number roll, it forces me into combat. My only grievance with this setup is you can find enemies in between steps since the tile movement is that 16 pixel movement based off of one tap. Technically it should only be finding them when I hit that new tile and this finds them anywhere in between so even if I'm 15 point something pixels from where I originally left I'm still technically overlapping grass even if I'm walking out of the grass. So it is something I plan to make truer to the game if I continue working on this project, but it does technically work correctly, it's just a visual annoyance at this point. And to go into combat from here, I create 18 black sprites on the edges, 9 on each side, that stack left right left right, all the way down, and I just grow the width of those across the screen, and this just creates that one of the transitions that Pokemon uses when you go into battle. Once those go all the way across, it loads in the fight. And of course we need to lock that character movement again. We don't want to be walking around in the background while we have a fight on the top of our screen and we're picking skills. So we're in the heat of battle now. I set some bullions for fighting to track if I'm still in combat, to track if I attacked, if the enemy attacked, if I escaped. And this is where my code begins to get pretty spaghetti. And if you haven't heard the term spaghetti code, essentially imagine looking at a bowl of spaghetti noodles and trying to understand where one spaghetti starts and then where it ends and of course you can figure it out by moving the spaghettis around but it is going to take you a lot of time and then when you look away again it's reclustered. So I have a lot of different checks in this stage telling me where I am in combat and at that point I ended up going back to work and that means I barely get any coding done for my game. So when I came back the next weekend I had to refigure out all of my combat and I'm sure I overwrote a few of my checks and essentially redid actions in a, a weird way where it definitely needs to be reorganized but it's a large project to get back in there. So until I have something that brings me back into the combat I will keep this spaghetti code here and we will just be happy that everything works so it is safe for now. I did all this for a single enemy which my first one created was my Pidgey, but I did have the foresight to understand that the skills would change with the enemy as well as the different stats would have to be brought in. So I did set it all up to where I would essentially call the same enemy no matter what, and I would just change the animation shown based on what enemy was called. So I just named every animation what the Pokemon I'm finding is, and when I find that Pokemon it calls the animation up and then it sets all of their stats. As far as stats go, I didn't add anything for IVs or EVs, though if I continue working I do plan to add IVs just so we get a bit of the randomness. And additionally, based on the level of some of the enemies, they can learn more than their four skills. And to do this, I just created four skill slots and force put in the ones that all enemies will have, so usually like the level one through three skills which is usually like growl and tackle or something like that. The next two skills just go in slot three and four, and then if they are a high enough level to learn a fifth skill, they simply just pick a random spot between one and four, erase the old one, and put the new one in. And then when they actually cast skills in battle, they don't really know what they're casting. Instead, they just grab a random skill slot and they use that skill, which I didn't want to give them too much AI anyways, since in at least the original Pokemons, they seem pretty random. They would essentially lower your defense three turns in a row and then use a special attack, which didn't matter about your defense at all. Now, once we pull all the information from the skill, we can simply plug it into the equation. And this equation is pretty straightforward. I just grabbed their actual damage calculation. And all we have to do is check whether or not it's a special or a normal attack and exchange whether or not we're using normal or special defense for this. 
And after building up my fights, I had all normal attacks for a while since you start out with low levels. So once I added in the special attack for the first time, I had to verify everything was working right with a quick bug test. And usually I will finish a project completely and then go back and edit it. But I wanted to show a small clip of some real-time troubleshooting on my end, which I then voiced over and edited just a tiny bit to keep it uh, moving a little more exciting. But this is my debug session. Alrighty, I just finished doing my special attack and we'll do a deeper dive into testing it. So first things first, I need to find me Pikachu. It's the only thing that uses special attack at this point. And there we have it. And then I'm gonna go ahead and set myself some extra health. That way I don't have to worry about dying while I'm just spamming slaps. And nothing happened on his first attack, so that's always good news. Uh, hopping back in the code, I found I spelt it differently on these skills based on what the damage was coming from. So switch that back up and hop back in, find myself another Pikachu. And the testing goes and he hits me for 7 damage. And using my big brain I set my special defense up to 70 and test again. And he hits me for 7 damage because I don't use special defense outside of prepping for combat. Uh, once I'm in combat all of my damages and defenses are based off temps. And now that I set that one to 70, it brings his damage down to less than 1, so it rounds it down to 0 damage dealt. And just looking at the code, uh, I threw in the numbers I ended up testing with last. Total came out to 15 damage, which is about what the damage was that I received. Which means it is working right, it was just a lot lower than I expected. And digging a little deeper into the algorithm for damage, all defenses are divided by an extra 50 power. The skill that Pikachu is using is a 40 base. So essentially the attack stat, or special attack stat in this case, is weakened by the fact that we are multiplying by 40 and then dividing by 50 since it is just a 40 based special attack skill. Alright, as promised, I do have some thoughts on how to make the game a little more complex as the Nintendo Overlords originally intended. Uh, we will be leaving the plot and the exact detail changes on the side burner for now and breaking it down to the simplest form. It will just be a crafting system uh, where you are going to be farming different Pokemon and collecting their materials. And with those, you'll be able to make different items such as armors or weapon enhancements. And when you make these, they'll be able to give you that element type for defending as well as giving your skills a different element for attacking, which should give you that extra level of complexity when you're choosing what you want to go into battle with. I think this could be fun, but I am going to leave that up to the players. We are going to do this strictly by whether or not people ask for it or refuse it in the comments below. Let me know your thoughts. Do you want a level 2? Do you want more of this game? Or do you want me to simply move on to something else? And in case I don't get any comments below because no one's watching the video anymore, which I think is probably going to be the case, I'll make up my own mind. And for everyone still out there watching, thank you so much. I love the support. And if you feel like supporting a little more, down below we have a support me link. Give me a dollar, it'll make my day. Anyways, thank you all so much for coming down and watching the video. Catch you next time.